we're looking at uh, the, the series around fundamental, we're looking at fundamentals of equities, um, uh, fundamentals of business. And when, when we first chatted, we, uh, I, I broke it down into really four, four categories. It's, you have a look at profitability, liquidity, solvency, and management. Uh, last time we chatted, we spoke about profitability. Uh, this week we're looking at liquidity. Now, liquidity is often often ignored part of of, of a business. Yeah, everyone talks about how much profit the business makes, and if the business runs into problem, everyone talks about uh, how much how much debt the business has. What is the bridging gap between the two is really liquidity, and it and in a large way it's it's a leading factor, uh, a leading indicator of how a business is doing. Um, but let's start off. Let me jump into it and let me start off by defining what exactly is liquidity. First of all, it's the ability to pay debts as they fall due. This, this includes short term, well, this, this, the emphasis is on short term here. Uh, the ability to pay, pay uh, costs and expenses as they arise. And that ability is obviously dependent on cash. Um, hence, it's the ability to turn sales and debtors into cash. There's a very big difference between generating a lot of sales, um, building a huge amount of debtors, and actually having cash. Um, think about it. The, the difference between the two is bad debts. So you're, and not just that, if you can do a cash sale right now, or you do a, ca or you do a, a credit sale and you get paid in a thousand years' time, there's a massive difference in value between the actual sale. Uh, finally, it's obvious, cash is king. Uh, there's, there's an old saying in business where it doesn't matter what the profits are, you can, be, you can be making eternal losses. If there's always more cash coming into your bank account than it is going out, you're, you're in business. Um, and hence, cash is king, and that's what liquidity is all about. Uh, now... Liquidity is uh, interesting. It's an interaction between the income statement, the balance sheet, and the cash flow statement. Um, the, these are these are the ways companies present their annual financial statements. So that your your ability to understand the, these numerical representations of uh, financial position, financial performance, and cash flows is critical. And liquidity is one of those very interesting, really really interesting uh, parts of a business that actually. Every every financial uh, every uh, statement, you know, income statement, balance sheet, your cash flow, actually interacts with it. Uh, let's start off with the obvious one. Liquidity is about cash. So let's have a look at the cash flow statement. Now, uh, cash from operating activities. It's simple. It's 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 really how much of your sales. Uh, you you you're having a look at how much of your sales are turned into cash. And that's where you get your working capital part that strips out the amount that become debtors and your reinvestment in, in stock, maybe potentially the build up in creditors. Ironically, or interestingly, you may never have looked at this, but creditors are part financing your business. So as far as possible, if you can get your debtors to pay early, and you can pay your creditors late and have minimal stock, then this, ca this number right here, the working capital change will be as small as possible, hence your cash generated for operations will be as high as possible. Then obviously you have your cash investor invest in, uh, up, uh, cash flow from investing activities. That, that's often the reinvestment into operations, be it property property equipment or acquisitions or whatever, and, and then you, sometimes you sell those investments. You can sell your PPN stuff. Uh, financing activity is simple. It's quite literally that. Cash, uh, or it's, it's uh, issuing uh, shares, repurchasing shares, raising bonds, and the like. And the interaction between all of these um, leads in your net cash position, uh, or leads to your net cash change, that leads to your net cash position, and it directly influences your liquidity. A little bit of a theoretical argument. Let's, let's have a look at the details. Um, working capital. Working capital is simple. It's your debtors. Uh, well, first of all, in the, uh, in the uh, cash flow statement, the working capital sits right here. Um, it's, it's a key one to watch, and depending on how, if they represent a, a cash flow statement, a, a direct or indirect method, um, they may have, have this uh, working capital displayed on the face of the uh, cash flow statement or in the notes to the cash flow statement. My advice is it doesn't matter where they hide it, go and have a look, it's critical. So working capital is simple. It's debtors, creditors, 
an inventory. Let's have a look at debtors. Debtors is simple. Uh, it's how, how much of your sales are in cash versus credit. Credit has a cost. It not only has the potential to go bad with the guy's default, it also has a, a financing aspect. If you sold, if you had to buy uh, something from someone and then sell it to somebody else, um, and they only pay you in in a say you know a hundred years time, you're actually financing that entire transaction for a hundred years. So obviously, the quicker you can convert your sales into cash, um, or the quicker you can convert your debtors into cash, the less you're financing that. Hence, so a ratio like a, a debtors' days is quite important. Um, we'll get to that. I'll be talking around specific ratios in a moment. Um, then, uh, so always a consideration in debtors is have a look at how many of the cash, how much of the business is made up of cash sales versus credit? Um, that's, that's particularly critical. Then inventory. You know, uh, if a company has to invest, over invest in inventory, it's actually a cost, once again. Uh, not only are you financing it, but you have storage costs, you have the, you're exposed to inventory obsolescence, particularly if you're in a technology game, you're buying, you buy a whole load of, say, computers, um, or iPad 1s, and then Apple releases iPad 2, who's going to buy your inventory? It's just become uh, obsolete. So you want, not only do you want to be able to convert sales um, into, into cash as quick as possible, you actually want to convert inventory into sales as quickly as possible, because then you're minimizing that risk. Finally, there's creditors. Creditors is are actually part, they're co-financers of, of, of a business um, by extending credit. And as far as possible that you, as much as you want to turn debtors into cash, you, you, you want to minimize your payments to, uh, your cash payments to creditors. Uh, and often, depending on uh, how much the creditors have sway or control of the business, is you, you will see by, by how much they're financing the business, i.e. how much they extend terms. Do, does the does the company that you're looking at have a paying power or not? And this is a question about how much the creditors own the business or the business owns creditors. Just some, some thoughts there. So working capital. It's simple. The best type of working capital is none. Working capital is a cost. You want to minimize it. What is the cost? The cost is the cost of holding stock. That, that would be an inventory side. It's the cost of admin. Um, from uh, debtors to creditors to inventory management, it's also the uh, and this is this is a often over underlooked aspect is the cost of financing. Think about it this way: if you didn't need working capital, you wouldn't actually need those funds. I.e., you could lower the amount of equity needed to be uh, to finance the business, and you could increase your return on equity, which we will always touch on this return on equity. It's the most critical ratio. So once, just touching on it, this is, this is an important point. Working, the best type of working capital is none. It really is a cost to the business. So uh, the more efficient the business is, the lower their working capital will be, obviously depending on sector. Um, yeah, sorry, just touching on the point I said earlier. Um, now, how do you calculate working capital? Working capital, uh, we've touched on it with the major parts. Um, it's creditors, less debtors, less inventory. So if your debtors and inventory is greater than your creditors, your working capital cycle is negative. And that is actually the norm for a business. Um, in, in some cases, like you look at some of the major retailers, you look at, for example, in the technology sector, there's Blue Label, and they run, they're in a very unique position where their creditors are, are so big and whereas a lot of their sales are cash and the inventory is turned over very fast, i.e. inventory is low and debtors is low. So actually, you have a, a, a situation where working capital is sitting in a massive positive. That money is, is actually a part financer of the business. Um, it's, it's earning interest, you, you're gaining on it. But like I said, sorry, that's more the exception than the norm. 
the norm is that working capital is a cost, and this is how you calculate it. So, so working capital, now liquidity is, is really a, an efficiency concern. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's not about strategic management, it's about day-to-day -day management. So this is why when, when we're analyzing liquidity, you're actually looking at the efficiency, the efficiency ratio. So let's, let's touch on a couple, so, a couple so that you guys can uh, crunch the numbers and you can compare them between businesses within industries. Um, it, well, it measures all, all aspects of liquidity in the business. The ratios are debtors days. Obviously, the lower your debtors days, the faster your sales are turning into cash. Hence, the more cash you have, the less you finance in debtors, the lower your admin costs, the less you expose to bad debt, etc. Debtors, debtors days are simple. It's debtors divided by the sales divided by 365. You, you're essentially saying, with this ratio, you're saying, how many sales do we generate per day? How many days do those sales stay outstanding to be paid? Um, then we have inventory days. It's the same approach, but obviously, also do you notice in this case how debtors, a balance sheet item, is using sales, an income statement item. I get back to how liquidity um, touches on all cash flow to income statement to balance sheet. It touches on all, all the uh, financial statements. Inventory days are similar. It's stocks divided by the, the daily cost of sales. You're saying how, how many, how, what is the average cost of inventory we sell per day? And how many in, how much inventory do we have on hand? Hence, how many days worth of inventory do we have? The, the greater the amount of inventory you have, the greater you have to finance it. The greater the cost of holding the inventory. Debt is days you want to minimize, inventory days you want to minimize. Uh, you also get the current ratio. The current ratio is extremely simple. It's liquid assets divided by liquid liabilities. So it's what on the balance sheet or the statement of uh, financial position, they call the current assets divided by the current liabilities. There's a much more critical ratio. It's called the quick ratio. And the quick ratio says, it, it says that inventories are, is, is, um, that's sitting on hand may not actually be converted to cash. So the quick ratio says, if we cannot sell any inventory and business closes shop, how liquid is the business? And, and its current assets, sorry, there should be a negative sign here, current assets less stock, i.e. how many liquid assets do, do we have excluding the inventory holding? Once again, divided by current liabilities, which are the debts we have to pay as they fall due. Um, Something guys don't look at much, but it is also critical, is look at the cash balance, and, but this is the point I want to touch on. Look at the net cash balance. What I mean by net is, is take out the debts in the business. Take out uh, not just the current debts, actually. Take out the, the long-term loans and debentures and all, all, all the different obligations the business has. What is their net cash position? Uh, often cash will earn a lower interest rate than debt will incur interest charge. So if a company is sitting in a position where they have a huge cash balance, but their net cash balance is actually negative, i.e. they have more debt than they have cash, the question needs to be asked, why don't you settle your debts? It's simple. You will, you will uh, yes, you're earning less interest, but your interest costs on that debt will be more than the interest you're earning on the cash. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very obvious, very numerical ratio, net cash balance. Very important. Don't forget to have a look at that. Um, yeah, as I was saying, notice the interaction between the balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow here. How ratios between the income statement and the balance sheet actually directly impact what comes through in the cash flow statement. Now, liquidity, uh, uh, reviewing the liquidity of a business is actually... It's often a leading indicator of, 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 of the, the quality of management day to day and how the business is faring. Uh, hence, it's actually, it can potentially be a warning sign if things are going well. Even though a company may be booking a lot of accounting profits, um, they could actually be running into liquidity problems that, that, uh, 
um, expand and uh, you know, can potentially take down the business. So here are some warning signs. First of all, sales and, sales and debtors are increasing, but the cash is actually dropping. What this is saying to me is, is that potentially you, um, your debtors aren't paying. So your, your debtor days are probably expanding exponentially, and that, that increases the risk that your debtors actually just go bad. And, and debtors going bad is simple. It's a pure and absolute cost to the business. You've given away that service or product for fully. That is a huge cost, and that is a warning sign. It also potentially means that uh, the company is actually chasing sales. They are willing to... to now, sales is an ego number. I go back to the first fundamental step. Look at profitability. Sales actually isn't important. You need it to make profits. But, uh, but profits are the, are, are, are the point of business. If a company is chasing sales um, at risk of bad debts, you, know, you, you actually have, you have, you have a problem waiting to happen. So be very, be, uh, very cautious of a company where sales and debts are increasing, but cash is actually dropping. Um, yeah, there's always a potential that the company could actually be booking sales early. Um, auditors sign off on lots of things, but no financial system is perfect. Uh, a, a good example is the construction company that has a contract that runs multiple years. How exactly do you book the sales on that? It's worth thinking about. Yes, there's, there's, um, there's obviously accounts regulations around it, and there's IFRS, this and that. Um, nothing is perfect. But uh, a, 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 an obvious sign of booking sales early is that your sales are increasing, and because you need a contra entry, it will be in your debtors. Your debtors are increasing, but there's no cash. Where there's no cash, there's no business eventually. Then another warning sign is that inventories are growing, but sales are actually flat or even down. What this is telling me um, is, first of all, you're actually increasing your inventory obsolescence risk. And probably the company is under-providing the inventory obsolescence, provi obsolescence provision, um, i.e., no one's buying the stuff. There, if no one's buying the stuff, there is no business. Um, uh, by implication, the products are not competitive. We go back to my, my iPad 1 example. Who's going to buy iPad 1 when iPad 2's come out? Um, first of all, it makes your, makes your inventory obsolete. Second of all, it's not competitive. There's um, w right within the product range that uh, iPad 2 has cannibalized the entire market share of iPad 1. Um, then, then there's the oh, we, we touch on the day-to-day -day fact. Um, once again, it could just actually come down to bad management. Liquidity is a day-to-day. Uh, event. It's it's managed. It's it's the guys on the floor on the ground doing it. Um, it's not your chair, not the company's chairman. The, chair, the company's chairman won't know the first thing about the company's liquidity. The CEO and the FD and these are the guys. But it also trickles down to the mid, mid management, down to the potentially bad stock or warehouse management, bad choice of what you're buying, bad choice of you know where you're buying it, how you carrying it, where you're sitting it. It's it's day to day signs. A final warning sign is that uh, if inventories are growing, but creditors keep dropping. This is a bit of a subtle point, but in essence, what, what this is telling me is that suppliers are in a dominant bargaining position. Um, you know, who, who actually has the sway in the business um, on a day-to-day -day means is not always obvious. And sometimes, say, uh, a good example is a business that d distributes, say, for example, only Cisco um, items, only Cisco products. Now, Cisco, Cisco has a whole range of distributors. Um, it, has, it has loads and loads of them, and it can give business anywhere it wants. But if, if that business's entire product, uh, entire business is built around selling Cisco, on selling Cisco uh, inventory, Cisco can actually make or break that business. And because of that, Cisco is in a dominant bargaining position, and Cisco can dictate payment terms. Um, hence, I talk about suppliers being in a dominant bargaining position. You, what you'll notice is that the company is having to buy 
more and more inventory. But because, once again, um, they don't have control of their uh, creditor, their creditor obviously wants to minimize their debtors because, well, their creditor is a business. So they want to minimize their working capital. How do you do that? You get your debtors to pay up front as fast as possible. Uh, so it's just a warning sign. There's perhaps over, over-reliance on the single supplier. If there's over-reliance, once again, the supplier is in the dominant bargaining position. So these, these are warning signs. And particularly when you see them across a couple of years in the business and they're getting increasingly worse, these warning signs are, are leading indicators of something that's going wrong. Um, so don't, don't, read, don't just read the income statement balance sheet and then page past the, 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 like a cash flow statement. Uh, to look at the, perhaps the dividend declaration. The cash flow statement is very important. It's showing all of this. Um, so what does a lack of liquidity actually do? Well, it's simple. Think of it from your personal perspective. If you ran out of money, but you have to eat, you have to live, you have to pay rent or pay your mortgage or whatever, um, how do you do it? Well, you start running into overdraft. Um, so lack of liquidity is, it catapults directly into rising debt levels and overdraft, rising debt and overdraft levels. Um, and if the lack of liquidity continues, um, what happens, or oh, obviously the cost, the short-term cost of, of, of bringing in further debt, and particularly overdraft, because overdraft is very expensive and it's callable on demand, um, is that the interest expense in the business will rise. Um, I just want to touch on the overdraft point. South African businesses have a habit of funding themselves over overdrafts. This is a bad thing. Overdraft, I would much rather, if you're sitting permanently in overdraft, I'd much rather a business formalize that into a long-term loan, and probably at a lower interest rate, uh, and lock it in and then pay that off, or, or just service that. Um, the reason being is simple. It's one single fact. Uh, overdraft, the contract of overdraft is callable on demand. That means, and I've heard of this, I know businesses that have gone bankrupt because the bankers have phoned them on Christmas Day and said, you owe us the overdraft. If you're sitting in an overdraft position, the reality is you probably don't have cash. You probably cannot pay that. So be very careful of, of, of a companies financing themselves over overdrafts and much rather have that formalized. But the lack of liquidity in the short term is simple. It turns into overdrafts. Those overdrafts turn into increased interest expenses those interest expenses, eventually the business is choked. It cannot pay its creditors. Uh, creditors call for liquidation. Uh, WG1 is, is a good ex- uh, example of what happened there, um, where the creditors get banging on the door. There's too much debt. Um, and it's simple. The end, the end point of liquidity, of a lack of liquidity, is bankruptcy and liquidation. Once again, go back to the example. If there's more cash coming into the business, the business's bank account than going out. You're always in business. Vice versa. There's more cash going out than coming in. You're going to go bankrupt. Just uh, t- touching on the conclusion is simple. is that cash is king. Um, a, a ratio I didn't want to touch on earlier because it's not exactly an efficiency ratio, but it's always one to, uh, interesting to track between business, between years, between reporting periods, is take your operating profit. Potentially your EBITDA, but let's be simple. Operating profit and divide it by the cash generated by operations. Um, actually, sorry, this formula is wrong. It should be inverted. The cash generated by operations divided by your operating profit. Um, you get in your efficiency ratio. How much of your net, of, of your net operating profit is being turned into cash? Um, and that's, that's, you know, that directly uh, catapults down to your, your cash, down to your business, liquidity, everything. Um, the cash conversion ratio is simple. So it's a pure factual indicator of efficiency. Um, it's, uh, so, yeah, the eternally pertinent question is how much of your accounts profit, of your accounting profits become cash? And, and here's the other part, how quickly liquidity is a timing concern. Um, so, in conclusion, liquidity is, is critically important. Don't overlook it. It's reflective of the quality of day-to-day management, and cash will always be king. Um, yeah, guys, I'd like to touch on some questions. Uh, I should can turn it over to Simon there. Muted. Folks, Simon here. Uh, 
first off, apologies for some of the problems here. We had to go to a backup system. Telcom hates internet at HPM in Joburg, it seems. Uh, if you've got any questions, put them in the uh, question text box. We'll take them there. If you've got a microphone attached, raise your hand. We'll come to you for a question. Keith, one question I've got already, which is coming from Susan. And she says, quite simply, in other words, profit is nice, but what we really need to worry about is actually the cash flows, maybe more than profit. Unmuted. Uh, Susan, you, you're right. Uh, so we get back to the example where if there's always more cash coming in than going out. You're always going to be in business. Um, what? Yeah, you know, it's, it's an interesting, debatable point. And uh, you see, when I talk about profits being the uh, the sole reason for business, it's I like to move away from accounting profits. Unfortunately, when you analyze profitability of a company, you're working with accounting numbers, so you have to touch on that. Um, I agree with you. Cash profitability is, is the core focus of business. Um, what, what, what I would say is that in the long term, if a company is legitimate, properly managed, is that accounting profits will reflect cash flows. They will tend to match in the long term. As even deferred tax on wines and you look at all the intangibles uh, become realized, etc., etc. et cetera. And cetera um, so liquidity is, uh, I like to look at liquidity as more indicator for the day-to-day -day management, profitability for the indicator of the, of the uh, competitiveness of the business and hence the return you're going to expect. Um, but yes, they are equally important. There's also one, one, one final point is really, it's interesting how, much, particularly when investing in the stock market, is how much the shares reflect uh, you know, the accounting profit. So particularly if you can understand the accounting profits, you can start to anticipate share price moves. Um, yes, in the long term, cash is key. Um, but in the short term, in the shorter to medium term, accounting profits will actually maybe dictate share prices, share price movements more than cash flows. Unfortunately, it's not the best, best scenario, but this is also the market we operate in. Muted. At the end of the day, everything comes back to fundamentals, but that can take some time. A question from Safiso. He's asking about debt, and he says, when you offset debt, do you look at the, and he's excluding uh, um, bank overdrafts that you referred to. He's saying when he offsets his debt, is he, is he worried about the total amount of debt or the cost of that debt that they have to pay, you know, their monthly or annual payments? Unmuted. Uh, I assume you're talking about the cash, uh, the net cash, cash position. Um, there, there, no, you're looking at the, the total quality, uh, the total uh, quantity, the nominal face value of that debt. Um, the reason being is, think about it this way. If you're sitting with a, a 100,000 Rand overdraft and 100,000 Rand in cash, well, you're earning maybe, I don't know, 5% in your cash balance and you're paying 10% of your overdraft, why don't you just stick that cash balance into your overdraft and then you're not paying anything. You're 5% ahead, ahead of the game then. Um, the same, the same approach with business, and that's why the net cash position is important, and that's why the face value of the nominal amount of the debt they still need to pay back is, is important. Muted. Folks, any more questions coming through? I'm not seeing any coming through, which means Keith either baffled or educated us. Gonna, ah, is no one coming there? Oh, okay, suddenly a bunch of them. Uh, Gavin, I'll take yours first. What if a company has too much cash? Surely then it's not always a good sign either. And that's a great question. A company that's just sitting on truckloads of cash, maybe a lazy balance sheet almost. Unmuted. No, I agree with you. It's simple. Cash, cash is sitting in the, in the asset side. Um, it would direct. Yeah, you know, having having a large cash balance would be reflected in having a having an elevated equity um, equity balance. Um, now, that actually lowers your return on equity. Because think about it, that cash balance is doing nothing. It's, it's earning interest rates, which are low, uh, yet your cost of equity is a hell of a lot higher. Hence, you know, it drags down the, profitability, the overall profitability of the business, ironically, having too much cash. So I agree with you. But in, in a lot of cases, and I've argued with companies about the, uh, their lazy balance sheets, um, Actually, this, this, this point we could literally have an entire webinar on because there's also asymmetry, a, asymmetrical risk profiles of directors. 
Big word. It's very simple. Um, the directors make more money often out of paying themselves than out of paying the shareholders. So there, but if the business goes bankrupt for lack of cash, then they have no job and they earn nothing. Shareholders uh, actually only lose the amount they invested. The director would lose everything. So often directors' incentives are actually to have lazy balance sheets because it ensures their jobs. Um, ironically, as a shareholder, you don't want that because you want to return, earn a higher return on equity and, and hence you know, maximize your profits and pay, pay out the excess cash as dividends. So yes, I agree with you. But you have to view it in the context of the industry they're operating in. A, a good example is Steph Nuti, currently sitting on the stock market. Got a big cash balance. I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. They're sitting in a cyclic, they're cyclical stock in a cyclical industry um, that's going through a rough patch. It's simple. You want that security because the business is good, but you want to be able, you, you want to make sure it's still there when the cycle turns. Um, as opposed, for example, you know, a, a non-cyclical business like a utility, like a, like a telecom, like a MTN, like a, you know, maybe a, a, if we saw ESCOM's balance sheet, so something like a, a utility that is, is actually non-cyclical, you want that company almost geared to the max minimal cash because it's always going to be selling. It's always going to have cash coming in. So uh, like uh, having a lazy balance sheet there would count against it. I know that's a long answer for a short question, but literally that, that question about balance sheet efficiencies, we could spend an entire another webinar. Muted. I'm glad you mentioned Stephanie because it's one of my favorites, and at least it's not all bad. Um, and Paul, let's say up here, I hope I got your first name right. He's asking, where can you find different ideal values for answers to the ratios you've indicated? In other words, to try and find them. And I'm going to throw out two answers immediately. Maybe Keith's got another. Um, go to Keith's website, uh, smallcaps.cozar, and go dig in the archives. You're going to find uh, uh, literally hundreds and hundreds of articles there. Um, and then websites such as Investopedia. Dot com. I suppose the question I'm going to throw to Keith is, are there definitive ideal levels where you can say above this is good, below that is bad, or is it more a bit holistic? Unmuted. Okay, well, it's, it's simple. We, we can touch on some major ones, uh, if, if you guys don't mind. Sorry, I just want to go back to there. Um, so, I mean, it always helps if you're talking about the ratios to actually show them. where the ratio is that far away. <laughs> okay, it's, the current ratio is simple. You want that above one. You want to make sure the company can at least pay its debts and you assume that no inventory obsolescence exists. Now, quick ratio often actually sits below one, particularly if you're sitting with, with a company that has a large exposure to inventory. Um, that is not bad. What my approach would be is uh, look at industry. Uh, if you're looking at a small company, like if you're looking at a spa or something like that, um, have a look at like a pick and pay, one of the blue chips, uh, to, to get an idea of uh, the overall industry norms there. Uh, quick ratio, you want, you know, it's, it's always better if that's above one, but it's, it's often going to sit just, just a bit below one. Um, if, that's, if that's sitting far below one, I would, I would, uh, I would be worried. Uh, the cash balance, net cash balance, we, we've touched on that. And then what else was there? Okay. Then, you know, just, just a broad answer to that question is, you know, liquidity and working capital is, is always an industry-specific thing. Um, you know, touching on Kuro, it's been the topic of the day, uh, is, is that uh, schools typically actually have a, have a negative working capital cycle, meaning that a pupil will pay their tuition up front and then they will actually, the school will incur the cost of delivering that tuition for the rest of the month or the term or the whatever period they pay it. So they're getting cash up front. So their ratios will tend to be very skewed and that industry will tend to be very different. Um, and if you were, so l look critically at the business model and compare it to other comparable business models within the same industry. Um, that's the best approach. The, the judge, the judge is always hard. Uh, it, 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 you know, it comes down to get an understanding for, for the overall fundamentals of the business 
And does the liquidity reflect that? Muted. Folks, I'm not seeing any more questions come through and we have overrun our time. Board, yeah, I appreciate because we had some issues up front. I'm going to leave it there. We will have uh, Keith will be back in a, in a month's time with the next part of his, his uh, helping us understand fundamentals, uh, making it, I think, easier than perhaps we thought. We don't need necessarily to be CFA. We're going to leave it there. My thanks to all of you for attending. We appreciate. Uh, apologies for the problems we had up front. Uh, thanks very much for your time this evening and thanks, Keith McClusson. <laughs>